In this workshop, we are going to explore uh, proper equipment location setup, slide um, or presentation design, rehearsals for speaking and narration, software and hardware suggestions, uh, and tips and recommendations on where to place your camera, um, how to effectively get good audio, how to light yourself in front of the, the computer, how to get good sound and um, backgrounds as well if, if um, you're looking to do a digital background. Um, by the end of this workshop, we should be able to identify effective equipment and software from home recordings, produce accessible presentation content, plan for a recording session, identify strategies for effective home digital recordings at production, and incorporate strategies for improving the recording process. Also, just a note, um, because we're going to try to, to get through this kind of quickly, we're going to save questions for the end. So we will be happy to take questions, um, but we're going to save that for the end if you guys don't mind. Um, first, tips and, trips, tips and tricks for equipment setup. Um, for the computer or tablet camera, it should be at eye level. Um, creating a familiar atmosphere for your students, even if it's virtual, is key to keeping their attention in your course. If you're using a laptop or, or tablet, consider stacking books underneath the device to alter the height. Um, keeping your device eye level will help to keep your students engaged in your presentation. Along with the camera, your microphone should also be placed in a central location. Depending on the type of microphone you're using will depend how you use it. If you're using a microphone that attaches to your computer, you want to be sure it's facing in the direction that you are speaking. Uh, if you're using a lavalier microphone, which is one that attaches to your lapel or to your shirt, um, then you, that will make things a little bit easier and you'll be able to move around a little bit more and have more freedom um, because that will basically pick it up wherever you are. Uh, we'll explore some of the hardware, which we, which you may find useful in just a little bit. Um, if you're working from a script, which we do highly recommend, it is best to keep that script on the screen, which you're facing at a high enough level. Um, if you're doing a zoom and recording, you can put the script on top of the video um, platform. And as you're looking at towards the camera, you can read from it. It will show your eyes moving and it will show you looking down just a little bit, but it really does help with effectiveness um, when you're reading from a script, as long as you've practiced. Um, you can also create a bulleted script with key points if you prefer. Um, sometimes working in front of a camera can make people nervous. So creating a script is highly recommended. We do encourage you to practice your script before recording as well. Turn your microphone on and record a few times with the mic. Your audio should be at a medium to high range without causing a pop when you speak. Um, we'll go over this a little bit in a few minutes as well. But if you're able to see audio levels in your program, um, you want to keep the levels from going into the red. Some programs have audio levels that you'll be able to see, some will not. Um, but staying in a green level or in that medium level is, is perfect and it will um, be very effective for your students. Okay, next we're going to talk about the general slide or presentation design, whether you're using um, Google Slides or PowerPoint. Um, there are some recommendations that we do make um, when creating these. And uh, if you've ever created a course through CLT, we do uh, have templates that we utilize that incorporate all of these elements, but if you have never worked through CLT or if you're developing your own course, um, these are very good guidelines that would be fantastic for you to keep in mind when creating your, your presentation and it also makes it accessible, um, which is very important for the university at this time. When you're designing your slide, you want to stick to a seven by seven rule. This means that you want no more than seven words across or seven lines down per slide. Studies have shown that, oops, sorry. Studies have shown that students stay more engaged when there are not quote unquote walls of text on the screen. We encourage you to use bullet points in your presentations and use your narrative to elaborate on those bullets. 
This will ensure your students must be taking notes or listening rather than just downloading your presentation. There are also specific copyright laws which you must adhere to. Um, be sure to use images that have been taken by yourself, are licensed as free to share, or that you have specifically obtained permission from the source for. Um, if you do Google um, images for your presentations, there is an option at the top to find open source um, and free to use images, which we, um, we stress very highly because it is illegal to use copyrighted images. And especially if you're developing through CLT, we will um, make you change them out. Um, you can also mimic certain designs. So if, if you're creative and um, you can uh, go into Photoshop or something, you can also mimic certain things that you see and recreate them in your own way to incorporate them into your presentation. Um, next, you want to keep your slides um, at 16 by 9 presentation, which is the, the standard these days. It used to be 4 by 3, and that's why I've given you these two images here, because um, some people don't understand the difference or, or might not know um, what the old standard was based on the new standard, and it, it runs the same for TV screens now. Um, but we no longer present in 4 by 3, especially because computer monitors now are in 16 by 9. And if you want your presentation to look proper when it's put up on the screen, then you definitely want to do a 16 by 9 presentation. Um, and you can go into your uh, slideshow settings and set it to either 16 by 9 or 4 by 3. But generally, the default will be 16 by 9. Um, uh, avoid background images. Um, when you're creating a slide, as you can see with my slides here, I have used white in the background with a very dark font in the foreground. If you start incorporating images to the background with font over it, it becomes very, very difficult to read. And this becomes an accessibility issue um, for those who aren't able to see very well. And it, even those who are able to see well, it's hard to read text on top of images that are put behind text. So unless you're going to make the image the only thing on the screen, we recommend that you not use background images um, behind your, your text. You also wanna use large legible fonts, um, anywhere from 20 to 40. And if you're using the seven by seven rule, this becomes easy because even with the 40 font, um, you can still more or less stay within that, that rule. Um, it really depends on the content you're using and how much you have based on the font that you'd like to use, but we do recommend anywhere from 20 to 40 so that it is visible for the students to see on screen. Also, when looking at fonts, you want to use a sans serif. And um, not everybody knows what a serif and sans serif is, which is why I gave you the example below. Um, but a sans serif font is the font that doesn't have the little, I call them little feet at the bottom of the letters. As you can see on the right hand side, the serif font does have those little ticks and the little feet. Um, the sans serif font is just easier to read um, and makes a very clean presentation as well. Um, also bold and italics should only be used for emphasis. Um, using them to highlight important words or ideas for your students is an, is an acceptable use but you should use headings rather than simple bold italics to organize your document and presentation. It will just help with the content navigation. Um, also talking about your presentation, you want to be careful when, again, using a colored background with colored font. Um, color contrast is very important and it is an accessibility um, guideline. The link in this presentation, the web aim contrast checker that is linked there, again, this presentation will be available for you to actually go through and click on the links. Um, but the web aim contrast checker will give you the ability to check your colors that you're using against each other. So it'll tell you whether they pass or fail. The top example would fail drastically. The pink on top of that blue um, is very, very hard to read even for people with good eyesight. Um, so imagine people that have a harder time seeing, they would not be able to read um, this, this font or this uh, color on top of the other color. With the um, example below, you have a darker background with a lighter 
white color on top. Um, this would pass accessibility and you would get a pass pass um, with the webbing contrast checker. I love this, um, this link. Um, I love this website. It has helped me drastically in doing presentations and even with creating videos and things, um, knowing what does and doesn't work. Plus it'll keep you um, ADA compliant. Um, all caps should be reserved for acronyms only. Um, with pictures that you will include in your um, presentations, you do need to add an alt text. This is again an ADA compliancy um, accessibility standard. Um, but for screen readers, um, when if someone that it, that cannot see is listening to the presentation, the screen reader will actually read the picture for them. And if you have an alt text, it will read aloud what is in that picture for them, um, which again is ADA compliant. So um, you do need to have alt text associated with those pictures. Um, do not underline text unless it is a link. Uh, as you can, huh? One thing to add to the alt text, just to note, you don't actually put image of you just describe what's in it. it all, the screen reader actually knows that it's an image. You just need to describe what is visibly evident to those that have sight. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen is our resident ADA compliancy police. She knows everything. We love her. Um, <laughs> as you can see, and especially in this um, page, you see all of the underlined links. Um, that is the only time you should use underlines because that does um, tell your student that there are links available there. <clears throat> um, also, you want to use descriptive um, text rather than the full URL. Um, the purpose of descriptive links is to provide users with the proper context of where clicking the link will take them rather than a screen reader narrating an indecipherable link destination for the user. Um, you want to avoid using nondescript text such as click here, here, more, read more, info, those kinds of keywords. <laughs> All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is rehearsal for speaking your narrative. Um, as stated before, it's important to practice your script before recording. It's imperative to practice pronunciation of longer or more difficult words so you won't stumble over them during your home recording. Industry standard is to practice your script in front of a mirror. I know that sounds crazy. I know your family will probably think you're crazy, but um, it actually works. This allows you to see what the camera will see. It allows you to see what your audience will see while you're speaking and pronunciating and the look of your face and how you use your hands even. Um, the form of your mouth when you say particular words and your facial expressions, and it gives you a better understanding of what your audience will see. Um, lastly, record yourself a few times and listen back to it. Adjust your audio levels where they need to be adjusted and listen for slurred words or areas that may be harder to understand. Sometimes you don't realize that when you're speaking, you slur certain words or you speak really quickly through a certain sentence. This will actually help you understand how you sound back to your audience. And in the picture here, um, we've shown you uh, an example of both a Mac and a PC volume controls. Um, <clears throat> when you record to see if your recording is loud enough, um, put your computer at mid-range, which you can see here in the Mac and the PC version. Both of those are in mid-range. If your audio, if you can clearly hear yourself, your audio is good. You don't want to be too loud in the mid-range, but you also don't want to be too quiet because majority of students will listen to their computers about this range. All right. <clears throat> when um, when we're recording, we have several pieces of software that we do recommend. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with Camtasia. It is a subscription um, program, but it is also um, really great. And I think that there may be some resources out there for 
faculty to obtain a Camtasia license for the amount of time they need to record. Um, so check with your departments on that. Um, you guys may have Camtasia licenses already. Everyone's using Zoom. We're using Zoom right now. But you can also record to Zoom and use that for your presentation as well because you have the screen share capability too. Um, so that's a nice that that's a nice program to use. Um, Microsoft Teams also gives you the exact same thing. We all have access to Microsoft Teams as ODU employees. Um, PowerPoint, you can do your audio with your presentation and it, you can also record your audio per slide. So some of it's a little bit easier to edit your slides because you can record it specifically to that slide. Uh, and finally, um, Kaltura, which is a video recording program um, only used through Blackboard, um, but that is also an option for you as well. And I believe uh, in one of our other workshops, um, we do go through Kaltura for Blackboard. So if you're interested in that program, we highly recommend that you look into that workshop as well. Uh, we also do offer a Zoom workshop if you're unfamiliar with some of the inner workings of Zoom. Um, we do have several beginner and kind of ad advanced courses for Zoom. Um, and I will give you the link to where you can find some more information on um, software we provide at the very end. Also, I wanted to give you some suggestions on hardware. When we're talking about home recordings, um, some people don't have access to, say, a computer with a camera. So we do have um, suggestions for, you know, uh, cameras that you are able to connect to your computer as well as um, more advanced audio options if you don't want to use the audio within your camera or if you want to try to um, not have as much echo in the background or um, just make it sound better. Um, all of these links here are um, equipment that we recommend through CLT and that we have actually used with faculty members and gotten fantastic results. Working right now with a faculty member that's using that Rode lavalier and the Canon camera, um, they together, he is producing fantastic course videos. Um, I, I, I know that sometimes it's a little bit pricey, um, however, if we're going to be in this situation for possibly longer than we all anticipate, uh, it might be a decent route to go to invest a little bit in um, some nice equipment that would really make your courses look fantastic. And again, these are all links. These are all linked to the actual product. So if you get to this um, slide, it will link you to where those products can be found. All right, now we're going to get to tips and tricks for the actual home recording. Um, so thanks to my daughter, she took these pictures for me this morning. Um, uh, I'm going to sh talk through and show you a few things um, on how to effectively record from home. So, let's see. So you want, if you're utilizing a laptop or a tablet. When you're sitting it on a table, it tends to sit too low. And unfortunately, you get the up the nose look. Um, and nobody really wants to see up the nose. So uh, nobody can see what it's actually being propped up on. So my suggestion would be to find a bunch of books, um, textbooks, binders, or boxes, anything that you might have that would be able to raise up your computer to eye level or almost eye level comfortably is ideal. Um, this will really help to keep your student engaged and it will help make a more natural feeling rather than looking up or looking down towards somebody. Also, um, this is my desktop computer that I actually have a riser for. So those are available as well. You can get those at Staples or Office Depot or um, whatever store you may be able to find at Walmart. Um, whatever store you might have available. Um, these are really nice too because it just bumps it up a little bit and you're able to to use the space underneath your computer as well. So I just wanted to show you that too. Also the notches that you see that's holding it up, those are adjustable so you can make it uh, taller or lower. Home lighting. Now this can be 
tricky for some people. Um, there are some important key points that you want to remember when lighting yourself in front of your computer. You do not want to sit with a window behind you. I am currently sitting, I know you can't see me yet, but I'll, I'll show you um, when, I, when we come back out of, of the presentation, but I am currently sitting in front of a window, but my shades are drawn. When you sit in front of the window, it, it pulls the light from the window and it completely blacks you out. So it is focusing on that light instead of you. So if you do have to sit in front of a window, pull the blinds, pull the curtains, um, try to make it so that light isn't coming through. Windows can be useful, however, because if you sit with the window in front of you, the natural light can work to your benefit. Um, also with um, adjusting shadows, um, if you don't have substantial light where you're sitting, it's beneficial to find two lamps or some sort of lighting equipment and put one on either side of your um, computer screen. I currently, this is my setup this morning. Um, again, my daughter took this video for you, but um, I'm gonna show you really quickly how you can easily make lighting go from very, very harsh to softer. Um, sometimes when you use lamps and you light them on yourself, it creates this really harsh, bright light on your, on your face, on your body. There is a very easy way of diff what we call diffusing the light. Um, so I'm gonna play this video for you. But as you can see, when I turn this light on in, that, in the video, it just, it blows me out. All I do is stick a silk scarf over it or some kind of um, transparent material, wax paper, um, uh, any kind of white material that the light can still shine through it. Um, it will just diffuse the light. And now you can see in, the, in my monitor that I'm more evenly lit, that I don't have this harsh light on my face. I'm still currently using that lamp right next to me. Um, and that's helping with just light the front of me so that I stand out in the, in the camera. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Krista is gonna show you her setup really fast. She has a window to her left and she has a lamp to her right. And with those two, it's helping to create an even an even um, light on her face. So as you can see behind me, I think we're back on me now. As you can see behind me, I have drawn my, my shades and I have also closed the blinds over there and it helps to darken the background and it helps the light that I have right here. Like I said, I still have my lamp. It's actually my son's Star Wars lamp, but you know, you gotta use what you got around the house. Um, but with that, just a little bit of the silk scarf, as you can see how harsh that light is. All it takes is that little bit of fabric to just soften it right up, which is really a fantastic um, um, little tidbit to know because you're bound to have something sitting around the house that you can use for that. You don't have to have fancy lighting equipment. You don't have to have professional lighting equipment. Um, you can literally just use things you have around your house um, if you know how to use them. All right, we will go back just a few more slides and then we will go to questions. All right, are we back on my slides? Okay. Um, obviously, we all know this. We want to record in an area of your home that is quiet and distraction free. Fortunately, right now, for as many of us, that's not always a possibility. I've got three children running around. One's a toddler. Um, it's not easy for all of us. However, it will be beneficial to your students if you try to make, if you try to find a time, maybe it's in the evenings when everyone's gone to bed that you record some of your things because with distractions, it can distract the student as well. Um, and I know we all wanna do the best we can and um, that would just be our recommendation um, just to, to try to find a, a quiet and distraction-free area or do something um, when children have gone to bed or the dog's not outside barking. We're lucky my dog's not outside barking right now. 
Um, <clears throat> also, when you're thinking about recording, make sure your background that you're using is uncluttered and distraction free. Um, right now, my kitchen is behind me, my little breakfast nook, um, but it's cleaned up. It has doesn't have things sitting around. It doesn't have distractions for students to be looking at and picking things out of while they're trying, while they're supposed to be listening to you. Um, but it really does help. If you're sitting in front of a bookshelf, just tidy it up a little bit. If you're, if you are in a cluttered office, maybe just tidy up papers and things like that. Um, or the other option that we have is through, a, through some of the programs, um, especially Zoom, you're able to do virtual backgrounds. Sometimes these work great, sometimes not so much. I would recommend though, if you're going to use a virtual background and you really want your students to, to listen and stay engaged with what you're saying, that you use something simple. Um, I know a lot of people like the, the beach with palm tree and all that, but um, sometimes keeping it simple is better for your students and it will keep them more engaged rather than being distracted by what's behind you. Um, another option would be um, if, your vir if your virtual background doesn't work with the background you currently have, which sometimes it doesn't key you out properly. And keying just means where it's cutting you out of the picture and, in and embedding the picture behind you. Um, if you have a green screen, if you have a green cloth that can act as a green screen, everyone's seen that in movies and things. That's how they superimpose images um, into movies and backgrounds. And we also do that in the uh, studio when we produce our CLT courses. Um, but if you do have the green background, that will help with um, the virtual background looking a little more pristine and a little more cut properly. Um, however, one suggestion would be don't wear green when you do the green screen. Um, any kind of green, green necklace, anything, it will cut that out as well. Um, just a little tidbit to know. Also, um, when recording your video, center yourself in your shot, shooting from about mid waist and leaving about an inch to an inch and a half headroom between the top of your head and the top of your monitor or the top of the video. Um, this will give you a more professional look. This is how we shoot your videos in the studio. Um, this is how most talking headshot videos are recorded. Um, so it will just look more professional and it will um, keep you engaged and it won't, you won't have all this room above your head and it will just look more proportionate as well. Um, for this, uh, I'm actually going to turn it over to Kristen really fast since she is our accessibility guru. Um, so Kristen, if you want to just explain this real fast. Yeah, and we're going to, I'm going to try to go through it quickly. So the two main things to note is that if you're just doing audio, so if you have no visual component and you're just recording audio of something, you do um, need to include a transcript. And part of the reason we even say the script is not only to help prepare so that you know what you're saying and it, it's gonna roll off your tongue a little easier because you've practiced it. But this can also be used for the transcript itself if you're doing an audio only recording. The link for webbing, captions, and subtitles gives you a what is re or what's required when I'm recording. Um, and then if you have video and audio, you are required to have what's called synchronized captions, often in a, an SRT file. And that, if you are using Zoom, you can actually make it create the audio transcript um, file and push it um, with, your, with your video to Blackboard. Blackboard does have with Kaltura auto synchronized captioning, but I will let you know they are not very accurate. So if you're using Zoom, we do suggest you actually use the transcript that's provided from Zoom if you turn on the audio transcript. To learn more about that, make sure you look for the Zoom workshops and then the transcripts are also suggested. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. Um, we, for Universal Design for Learning, transcripts not only help students with uh, accommodations, they actually help your students that are, are not um, using it necessarily because they couldn't, couldn't hear you or, could, or needed to read it. It can actually be used as a studying tool as well. And that might not necessarily a transcript be, you know, available right when you put the recording out. That could be maybe when you're getting to the study portion for that section, you could make those available. The transcripts, though, are required for audio only. So two, two themes, transcripts for audio, synchronized captions, which are like the closed captions that 
um, can populate at the bottom of the video and Kaltura and Zoom both have the ability to do those quite easily. Thank you, Kristen. No problem. This is our last slide. I just wanted to um, give you guys the Keep Teaching website, which uh, is available on our clt.odu.edu website. There's a Keep Teaching tab up in the left-hand corner, or if you click on this link in the slide, um, it will take you directly to the Keep Teaching website. But it just has a lot of resources, videos, um, um, Word documents on what programs we recommend, how to use them, um, we also encourage you to look for other workshops that you're able to uh, attend that would benefit you. Like I said, actually, I'm going to stop screen sharing and talk to you guys. Um, with Kaltura and Zoom, we have lots of workshops that incorporate those as well. In fact, I'm teaching the Zoom one next week, I believe. Um, and other, other workshops that benefit you for Blackboard and, and um, integration of Blackboard and Zoom and things like that. So with that, I have kept it to 35 minutes. I did pretty darn good. Um, this is the first time we've offered this workshop. I really appreciate everybody coming. Um, I hope this was beneficial to you and I would like to now open it up to questions. I am here for as long as you guys want to ask them. So let me know if anyone has questions. or even if someone just wants to let me know that this was beneficial to them. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, who, who is this? Uh, this is Robert Holden. Hi, Robert. Could you talk a little bit about the advantages of Camtasia? I've been, I've been using PowerPoint, recording PowerPoint shows and uh, with the video inset of myself speaking. And should I be using some other format? Was Camtasia be better for that and also if we're just talking about video recordings of talking heads, why bother with a very expensive, fancy camera? Um, with our current climate, you know, I am, um, I'm a fair believer that we have to do with what we've got. And I think that a lot of people have um, computers now that have good quality video and good quality audio, but not everybody has that. Um, that's why some of these, that's why we do give these recommendations on some of the cameras and some of the microphones because people that may have older equipment, um, some laptops don't even have a, a camera or some PCs um, old, like old Dells don't even have cameras. So those, those people we would definitely recommend um, looking into purchasing um, a camera. And there are ones too that we recommend that are a little bit um, on the less expensive side, which I can also provide links for those as well. Um, but it's really to each their own. Uh, however you wish to record, it, it's not, I don't think it's imperative that you have pristine video. As long as you, you have clear enough video that you feel your students are engaged with you and are able to understand and see what you're doing uh, or, or, or you know, see what you're presenting. I think that that's really fine. These are just suggestions that we give. And of course, with us being a production department, um, we really strive to help people get the best quality that they can possibly have. But again, you know, if, if your camera on your computer works great and your audio works fine and you can still get across what you need to to your students, then that's perfectly fine as well. Um, to answer your first question about Camtasia versus PowerPoint, um, in Camtasia, there's a little more opportunity for like annotation and uh, call outs and things like that. Um, Kristen knows a little more about Camtasia than I do, um, but I have faculty members that use both. I do have a faculty member right now that has recorded to PowerPoint and it has been perfectly fine. Um, and it, I think it's really about your, how comfortable you are with the program you're using. And, um, you know, if it benefits you with what you're using, I'm not sure that Camtasia has anything miraculously amazing that would be different from PowerPoint. But I do know that you can do more call outs and, and annotations with it. I don't know if you have any input, Kristen. All right, I'm responding to questions in the chat as well. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> We got a lot of things going on. 
So yeah, and 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 um, Mr. Uh, Rumit Kokar actually just mentioned that the Mac camera, even on the newer, the front camera is only 720p, so it's not always great. Camtasia is pretty um, intuitive to use. Uh, it depends on how much, I mean, if you're just using it for screen capture um, and you're not really going to be on video, maybe you don't really want to use it because there are other things that are free that can be used. Um, however, because it is not for Zoom, for instance, um, Zoom is going through the cloud. So sometimes if your internet connectivity or anything, it might have some where it's not quite as clear. There are also some settings that you need to change. PowerPoint for narration works just fine. Um, some of them you just have to make sure you're either exporting it as an MP4. Additionally, because of the file sizes, you want to make sure with any type of video that you're doing, that you're not doing hours at a time. You should actually be chunking them into like what called mini lectures. So you would take a topic or subtopic and you're trying to keep them no more than seven to 10 minutes at a time. And that's going to help keep your students engaged rather than going for a full hour. And there's no interactivity that you normally would get in that face-to-face -face climate. If you do a shorter video and then add another piece for interactivity, whether that's, um, you know, in Kalpuri, you can add video questions within your video. So there are ways to incorporate that interaction even though you're not live with them. But when you do an hour long lecture and there's no, you know, conversation back and forth because it's a pre-recorded lecture, it's not going to have as much of an impact um, or engagement with your students. They're, they're going to get lost in that content or disengaged and not paying as close of attention. That's additionally why we really say don't put everything you're going to say on your screen. You want them to be able to take that presentation, maybe download it, and then take notes on it versus they're getting something more from watching what you're presenting, not just okay, I have the PowerPoint and it has everything they just said. Great, I'm not gonna watch that video. I mean, as a student, I'm going to tell you, your students are not going to take the time to watch what you produced if you don't add something to the conversation. So it's really, yes, if you're just using it for your like PowerPoint presentations, you can definitely just use PowerPoint to record. We're not saying definitely use this software. It's just some other options, especially if you're looking to do like transitions and add different themes, you know, between, I mean, there are, you can zoom in and pan out and things like that. So there, there are ways that it, you know, draws their attention in different ways if you learn how to use those other softwares. By all means, don't feel like you're obligated or, or need to do that though. Does that help a little bit? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Michelle, I see your hand raised. Hi, I have one of those older laptops that doesn't have the green screen capability. Could okay. you talk a little bit more about that green cloth sort of concept? Yeah, um, and I don't have one here, but um, we um trying to think right now with everything kind of being closed, but um, I even think that if you don't, even if it's not green, if you have a solid color behind you, are you on a laptop? I am. Okay. I would try to go to a room that has a solid wall behind you and try it there because um, it might, um, it might pick it up better because sometimes with the older versions, sometimes if there's too much stuff, it just doesn't work. Um, I would try going to a solid wall first, and if that doesn't work, um, I do know that there, I think there are some versions that are too old to run it, period. Um, Kristen's nodding yes. Um, but I had that problem at one point, and I'm on a newer Mac, and I had a problem at one point where it wasn't bringing it up. I moved locations, and it, would, and it worked. So try that first, and if it doesn't work with the solid wall behind you, um, it, you may just have a version that's that of, of your computer that's too old to actually hand, handle the backgrounds. I'm not sure why it's not um, transferable with older computers, but we have run into that situation with others. It's actually the processor on the computer itself cannot, or your video card doesn't allow you to run it, um, we found out. And so before you before you go out and even think about purchasing a green screen or green whatever you might want to contact ITS help desk for them to show you where to look for those like what your computer's capabilities are to see if it's even compatible before you invest in that 
Okay, thank you. Try, do try the solid wall first, because sometimes that does help. Sometimes you just have too much behind you and it, and it doesn't work really well. Um, so try a solid wall and then go from there. And also make sure that you uncheck that you have a green screen. If you don't have an actual sheet behind you, some people I have noticed we're like, well, it's showing me as the actual picture and not behind me. And it's that they had check marked that they were, that they had a green screen. And the green, I don't know if you said this, Rachel, I apologize if you did, is actually uh, the furth furthest thing from your complexion. So it's kind of like re reversing because it's trying to find what it should put it on. So uncheck that I have a green screen. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, That's also why you don't want to wear green because it'll, it'll take out, like if I had a green shirt on and I was in a green screen, it would, look like I have no body. <laughs> uh, Karina, uh, what Zoom workshop were you referring to next week? I was just looking at the calendar and I didn't know if it was from us or if it was maybe from the Center for uh, Development. Um, I'm not sure. So uh, Rachel mentioned that she's giving the Zoom, so I don't know if it's this week or next week. There's a okay. Zoom uh, web conferencing basics on June 3rd and a Zoom Blackboard in integration on June 4th. However, on the Keep Teaching website, there are links directly to PDFs, and I did put the training and resources link directly into the Zoom chat. Um, I would start there, and there's also, we, we're trying, but as you, we're holding more and more workshops, so it's taking us longer to, you know, cut all of our videos and do all the editing. Like, we've recorded a bunch of items we want to share with you, but we're, we have to do all this post-editing, and that takes some time. So we have started a YouTube channel for Zoom at ODU, some items are on there. We're continuing to add, but it is taking a little bit of time. So check those resources if you can't wait until June 3rd. And if you have questions and need something prior to the workshop, please reach out to clt at odu.edu and we're more than happy to try to help you out to get that figured out. And I apologize, I must have my weeks mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Who does it right now? <laughs> Did you have a different question as well? No, I just wanted to add also on the Camtasia. I used it a couple of years ago, and I kind of piggyback on a license from a colleague. I, I never did uh, a screen recording or anything like that before, and it's very intuitive. I really like it, but because I've never used anything before, especially if you need to edit your videos, what I was doing is when I was recording, and if I made a mistake, I just made a pause and continue on, mm -hmm. and editing your video with Camtasia, it's really easy that I was not able to figure out with Zoom, so I left a lot of mistakes in my videos or I had to re-record things again. So Camtasia, I liked it because it was intuitive, but I kind of use it for free because I piggyback on a license from a, from a colleague. Yes, Camtasia is definitely a little bit easier to use. For the editing, especially in the middle, Zoom, you can kind of you can't really edit on the website. You can tell it when you're sending a recording link, which is only good for 30 days, what section from the front to the end, but you can't clip in between. Uh, once it gets pushed from the cloud, you can use the Kaltura tool to do some post editing. However, and that's in my media, uh, it, it is not quite as intuitive in my, um, my experience, as well as I just even though it's similar, it's not quite as easy to get to that nitty gritty if you're wanting it to be more pristine um, as Camtasia allows you to. Uh, Cole, I think you had your hand raised earlier. Did you have a question? Yes, please. Sorry, I'm still learning the Zoom functions myself. I had a, uh, two questions about using YouTube. Um, first, thanks for this presentation. A lot of insights. Um, I know that YouTube offers closed captioning. Is that acceptable within the mandatory expectations for captions and videos? So Zoom does give you closed captions. It is sometimes accurate and it's sometimes not as accurate. One thing to think about is that is going to be externally facing though. Um, we don't really suggest you necessarily put all of your, your content on YouTube because then anyone can really have access. Yes, you, you can change the privacy settings and such, but it's actually better to have it in Blackboard rather than putting it there. Now on Blackboard it does, if you upload a video, it will do an auto um, closed captioning as well. Not the most accurate. That's why if you are using Zoom, we are suggesting you use the actual audio transcript and convert it because it is more accurate, unfortunately. And I know like, it's also a lot easier to make changes to the audio transcript in Zoom if there is something that doesn't match what you actually say. Um, 
we're putting like items such as tutorials on YouTube, but it's not our course content. So um, I don't, is Crystal still in here? Yes, Crystal, do you have anything to add regarding the YouTube? Crystal's another part of our team. She's in with us today. I just wasn't sure if she had anything to add regarding posting things to YouTube, although the closed captioning is technically there. Crystal, are you there? Messy. Yeah, no, I'm there. Okay. Um, I mean, certainly you can set YouTube to private, but um, you know that doesn't keep your students from sharing links out. Um, you certainly want to be cognizant of that. I would say you know, probably put it in Blackboard would be best, or you could do a voice thread, um, you know, which you can then share between two sections. So you could obviously you know transfer it semester to semester. Great, thanks. Uh, and the second question I had was uh, with regard to image copyright. I was aware that I needed to be embedding images from Creative Commons, um, but regarding embedding like a TED Talk link, uh, usually I utilize a TED Talk as like a supplement to a reading for say class discussion. Uh, should I also not be embedding, and whether it's on TED.com or whether it's YouTube, um, are we, is, is that a, a violation of copyright as well, including content like that? Crystal, do you wanna to talk to that? Cause you just did that poster. So as long as you're linking back to the original content, you can do it. Um, Blackboard in fact has a tool that you can integrate straight to YouTube. So as long as you are linking directly back, the students are going to that website, um, then you're fine. One thing to note, I know that one faculty member specifically had YouTube videos link that did not have closed captioning, make sure that whatever you are linking to does have it. Otherwise, it is not following accessibility guidelines. So some of the older videos didn't have them. Great, those are my questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, Mitzi Nall, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your first name. I don't wanna, I see a hand raised. They just lowered yes. your hand. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a question. Do you have any tutorial for Camtasia? on Blackboard or anywhere? It is not specifically for Blackboard. So what we would suggest is we're gonna send out the link to the actual, or I'm sorry, we're gonna send out the PowerPoint. We're also going to be posting it to the Keep Teaching website, but it has a link directly to TechSmith regarding Camtasia and they have their own tutorial stuff on there, which is what we would suggest you look at anyways, because it's a, a, a standalone software, but then you would upload the video to your My Media in Blackboard. So it's it's like you do editing, you could record and edit in Camtasia, but then you would upload that MP4 to your Blackboard course. Well, you would upload and then publish it. So Zoom and Camtasia are two different softwares though, right? They Correct. do not interact. Correct. So, so for instance, if I did a Zoom recording, I could technically download the Zoom recording and put it into Camtasia and do post editing. But they're okay. actually two totally separate softwares. Okay, but I can edit the Zoom recording in Camtasia. Mm -hmm. You can, okay. as long as you import the MP4 into the actual Camtasia software, yes. Okay, so in the middle, like in a Zoom uh, uh, recording, if I have something in the middle of the art, uh, of the recording, uh, sometimes I, I couldn't, I wasn't able to do that. I could only do it from the beginning or the end, um, maybe, um, Maybe I need more training, but so with, I, if I can do it with Camtasia, that's great. And I believe, and I'm trying to pull up the Kaltura link, so give me just a second. I believe that you, there are some post editing options for Kaltura. Uh, Crystal, while I'm pulling that up, did you have, have you used Kaltura to edit your videos at all? No. She's both a faculty member and our, our team member, so that's why I'm asking to see if she has any experience. No, I've not used Kaltura. Okay. Give me just a second, I'm gonna open the link to, our black for, oops, that's not the one I wanted, sorry. Because it does give you some ability to um, edit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this document as well in the actual chat to everyone regarding Kaltura My Media. Um, so it allows you to do some editing. Um, you can use it to create clips. It, it is pretty, um, I, I haven't used it as much just because, like I said, I don't find it as easy to use in my opinion. Um, that doesn't, but it is free at least too at that point um, within your Blackboard um, 
tools. So if I am trying to get to an actual video to try to edit one really quick, just to see how it is. Um, it is taking a minute. It takes a minute just to get to anything. So I'm going to go to edit. I'll share my screen so you can kind of see what it looks like. So within here, I have opened the editing tool and this is part of um, a different workshop we had done. And as you can see, it's somewhat similar, but I, I'm increasing how large the, the space in between is and it's still not quite as easy. Um, so if I wanted to like chunk a piece off of it, I could delete if it will let me. And it's not, hold on, I don't want to split. I want to actually delete. So to me, this is a little bit more difficult to use. It's a very small window right now. I don't have the ability to, I could collapse the panel, but that's about it. I, I don't, I can't do as much as easily versus here. Let me pull up Camtasia really quick. So bear with me for a second. I'm just pulling up the software and I'll pull it to that side if it's not there. It's very slow. So if I'm in Camtasia, I can import my media here and you, you'll see that I'm just going to do um, a short one. Oh, except it's not going to let me possibly. There we go. Oh, that's just the audio, though. So hold on. Let me import something else. Um, Twenty clicks. I apologize. So when I pull it down as part of the actual, and it's fighting me because I've got so much going on right now, you'll notice I can see it a lot easier in here for editing purposes. I can actually mark where I'm starting so I don't have to edit right away if I'm thinking about it. I can increase how the distance so I can see really to the nitty gritty of where I want to edit it. I mean, it has a lot, it's just a little easier to edit so I can pull this to the beginning. I don't want that anymore. And I'm going to cut it. And that was how simple it was. I mean, it, it, to me, this is a lot more intuitive. It's a little bit easier to use, in my opinion, for post editing. But and then you can do the same thing from in the center as well. I could say, oh, this part, I wasn't saying anything. And you can go frame by frame in here, things like that. So there, there are pros and cons like, yes, this is a paid subscription, but you obviously get a little bit better quality from this. Did that help a little bit? I know that I, it, to me, like the free thing in, in Blackboard is it's great because you can do like minor edits to like the front and end of your videos. But other than that, it's not as easy to use in my opinion. So does, does ODU you have a paid subscription to Camtasia? Yes, right? Yes, we do so, because we're, we're doing a lot of things with video in our department. We can use it. We can use it. Well, for no. So it's not something that it's across everyone in like not all faculty and staff have it you actually have to purchase it like we had to purchase a, a plan oh i see so as a faculty member we we have to purchase a plan to if, to use if you want. so this is not something you have to use it's just something you can use if you want to do post editing now the other thing that's another reason why we really suggest you keep your video shorter because even if there are little hiccups it's not an hour long where you have you know 10 minutes of you you making mistakes that you didn't get to edit out kind of thing. So that's another pro of making sure you're doing like short mini lectures rather than doing longer pieces for the students, especially if you don't have the post editing capability. What about we're doing a live class and I do not have the opportunity to do a short video editing and I have an hour and 15 minutes of a class that I have to do uh, during a live session. For the live session, I wouldn't worry about post editing other than maybe taking off the front and end of the video. 
it's okay if there are some mistakes in between. It was a live class. When you're trying to do a pre-recorded lecture, we do, you know, if you want to make it look cleaner, obviously live, it's different. You'll, you'll notice even today when we are talking about things, we, we made mistakes. Right. That happens. And that's to be expected. And, and if they're looking at the recording of the live session, they should expect that not everything is going to be as crisp or clean. Okay. But for like short sessions, that's what you, 30 minute yeah. session. Yeah. And I mean, if you're doing the short sessions again, like if you're doing the short sessions, the clips at, at the front and end, if you have a couple mistakes in the middle, it's going to be okay. It's not going to, you know, they're not listening to an hour of you and you had, like I said, sometimes it will be 10 minutes because you've made a mistake, but you don't to start a recording. If you're doing an hour video, every time you make a mistake, you're never going to get through the recording, right? I mean, if, if you were pre-recording it and it was not a live session. Yes. It's impossible not to make a mistake, even when you have a script. But that's part of the reason why we talk about making a script, because it's going to help you if you're practicing what you're actually saying. I know when we lecture, it's not always the same. A lot of times you're, you, are, you know what to say and it just comes off, but you also have an audience and there's a little bit of an interaction. So it's a little bit different when you're just speaking into a camera. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, it is 12 noon. We have officially made this an hour. Um, we thank you guys for staying around. We thank you for tuning in. Um, I, I hope this was helpful. Um, we will be sending evaluations out after um, this is finished. We will also make uh, or have access to the recording of this um, workshop as well as the PowerPoint that we presented with the links in it. Please explore some of them. They're incredibly helpful. If you have any other questions, email us at clt um, at odu.edu. And um, again, my name is Rachel and Kristen was my, was my sidekick today and we, we thank you for being here.